summer after finals and after grading is all done. I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation and listening and, and learning a lot about a subject that I'm not familiar with too much. Um, so thank you, Dr. Richbay, for all of your, your sharing with us so far. And uh, very excited for today. We'll begin with a prayer. Uh, Good and gracious God, we thank you for the gift of life, the gift of today, the gift of all you, all you have created and blessed us with. We thank you for the gift of conversation and the pursuit of knowledge and ultimately the pursuit of truth that leads us to you. We ask you to be with us today, to guide our hearts and our conversations, that we may come to know more about this truth, about your truth, and about you. Amen. So, um, I didn't ask my children about science this morning, but uh, they, they never cease to amaze me when they talk about what they're learning in school. Whenever I ask my son, what did you do at school today, he says, learn. <laughs> so he's taking after me, because anytime they ask me, how was your day, Daddy? I said, it's good. Well, what did you do? I worked. <laughs> so they have no clue what I actually do, um, partly because I still am learning what I actually do. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here, and this is great. This is absolutely wonderful. Greg and I were already talking about next year, uh, so I hope you all can join us again next year. And I'll make a pitch at the end, but we're also at uh, June 22nd, we're having a faculty retreat in the Catholic Intellectual Tradition. And it's going to be off campus at Villa Pauline in Mendham, which is a beautiful, beautiful um, old convent that uh, it was the original mother house of the Sisters of Christian Charity in this province, in the northeastern province of New Jersey. And as their sisters have aged, they actually built an entire kind of basically hospital um, to care for the infirmed and the elderly of their order, and the original mother house is a beautiful retreat center now. Um, so a beautiful, beautiful um, estate in Mendham. So you drive past all these beautiful estates that I will never, ever be able to afford or look at or even drive up the driveway without getting in trouble. Um, but it's just a, a wonderful experience. Uh, I've been there several times. Uh, just good to get away. It doesn't even feel like New Jersey. Um, so it's, it's really good. So June 22nd, there's two flyers out you can scan and register. We have over 30 people already, so I hope you can join us for that. Uh, but without further ado, I know we're all anxious not to hear from me, but from our guest, uh, Dr. Principe. Thank you. Well, thanks again for, for all of you coming back to hear me thrown on again. Um, I must say that I'm enjoying myself as well very much here. The conversations have been just terrific. Your questions, your attentiveness is um, a real pleasure and honor for me. So today is our philosophical day. Um, I'm going to start by talking about um, causation, uh, about God and the natural world. And <clears throat> this allows me to do two things. One, um, on a very personal level, it allows me to talk about my beloved medievals. <laughs> which I will do. Um, but second of all, to bring to you the idea about how ideas that we have about God influence the way one has ideas about nature, that the two are not actually unrelated. Um, how involved is God in the running of creation? That, in, that influences the way one can study that creation, because we need to know um, what science is about what the causes of things are, that goes back to Aristotle. Um, and I'll, by, by the end of it, I will hope to get to some uh, modern examples, although I'll use uh, old uh, medieval examples, historical examples to illustrate uh, um, uh, uh, as we uh, develop the theme. Right, so <clears throat> it's been argued, for example, just the first very simple uh, example, that the concept of a single, eternal, and omnipotent God provides the necessary, although not sufficient, basis for science as we know it. This is because such a God can be taken to imply a kind of regularity which scientific study endeavors to uncover. And contrast this, let's say, with a quarreling pantheon of gods who are constantly doing and undoing one another's work and intervening in 
the way things happen in the world, that would tend to undermine one's confidence in the regularity or predictability of natural processes. And what we're getting towards is this very sophisticated, virtually unique in the ancient world, a uh, concept of God in Christianity as a creator outside was not part of the natural world, but primary, but prior to the natural world, not in it, but outside of it. So within Christianity, there's a range of historical answers to the question of God's activity. And what I'll start by doing is describing this as a spectrum of how God intervenes in the world or does not. Um, and we'll look sort of at the, at the ends of the spectrum first and then figure out historically where various Christian thinkers have uh, positioned themselves. So at one far end of the spectrum is what is called supernaturalism. And that's the, that's the view that God affects everything in the world. God is the immediate cause of anything that happens in the world. Um, simply put, all causation is supernatural. It comes from a power outside of nature, supernatural, rather than powers within nature. So of this position, there are actually several sorts. The easiest one to mention is what um, I'll call, for lack of a better term, naive supernaturalism, where the answer to all questions is a simple one word, God. God did it. And often this sort of naive supernaturalism is born of a kind of ignorance or a lack of interest in or even a contempt for natural scientific investigations and explanations of phenomena in the world. Uh, but uh, in addition to that sort of naive view, um, uh, sort of unreflective view, there's a much more sophisticated version of supernaturalism, which goes by the name of occasionalism. And according to this view, the links that we see between cause and effect, for example, um, let's see, we go in the morning to make up a pot of tea, we take the water and we put it on the fire on the stove. Um, we would generally say that the water grows hot because the fire is hot and heats the water. But as an occasionalist would say, would say that the fire has no inherent ability or power to heat water. Instead, the heating is the result of God's direct activity, and that putting the kettle on the fire is just an occasion during which God can act. So in other words, the fire doesn't have any power of its own. It's, 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 it's actually God doing the work. Um, well, supernaturalism, I think, in either form, potentially diminishes one inter one's interest in the natural world. If there's no causative power in natural things, then why should we bother studying them? Uh, it can undermine trust in scientific laws because the laws don't have any real existence and the natural world has no inherent ability to act. But that's not the only way to interpret it. Um, there have not been very many Christian occasionalists. There have been a few, but not very many. Um, they have never, however, conceived of God as capricious, that he sort of does whatever at any point in time. He acts in uniform and stable ways according to a kind of uh, covenant he established with the world at the time of creation. And that covenant fills in for the laws of nature. Um, another way of saying this, if we can use a medieval term, is that God constantly creates by his direct action what is called a cursus communis naturae, that is a common course of nature. Okay, well, at the other end of the spectrum from supernaturalism lies the position that God's direct activity, notice what I'm talking about here, is I'm only talking about theistic interpretations. I'm not talking about atheistic <coughs> ones, but you can uh, make the alteration yourself to, a, to an atheistic perspective. On the other end of the spectrum uh, is the position that God's direct activity ceased after creation. Um, under this conception, the phenomenon we witness are caused by the inherent powers or natures, to use the Aristotelian term, that God originally implanted in things. So this view is known as naturalism, that is causation is natural, it flows from natural things. So the idea here is that God delegates some of his powers to the things he created, endowing them with specific powers of causation. So fire gets your tea kettle hot because God in creating fire gave it a particular nature and the power to heat things. 
So in this case, the coarsest communis naturae, the common course of nature, is the direct result of natural causes operating regularly. So, um, and a way to describe uh, God's direct, uh, ver direct versus indirect activity was enunciated by the medieval theologians. They defined two levels of causation, primary and secondary. All Christians can agree that God is the ultimate cause of all that is, um, and created things came ultimately from his creative act, and therefore they are secondary to him. Thus, if they have powers of causation, those powers are secondary. That is, the powers of natural things are secondary causes. God is the primary cause. Supernaturalists rely on primary causation. That is, the first cause, God, is the cause of things that we see happening. So, in a sense, what we're arguing about here, what the different positions are, is how many intermediaries are there between God and the daily running of the world? So a supernaturalist would say none, and a naturalist would say some. So even if you are dealing with secondary causation, the secondary causes had to come from somewhere, so there's a train of causation back ultimately to the first cause. Um, the key point to notice here and reflect on is that as human beings, we cannot actually decide ultimately which is the true description of objective reality. There is no empirical test that's possible. All we can observe are effects and a temporal relationship between cause and effect. We cannot actually demonstrate an operational connection between what we sense as a cause and what we witness as an effect. So are causes really causes or are causes just happening at the same time as the effect? We really can't answer, we really are not able to answer that question. All right, well, there are, uh, there are objections to both of the two extreme positions that I've laid out for you. So, <clears throat> naive supernaturalism um, uh, flies in the face of our experience of the orderly, law-like behavior of nature. The occasionalist perspective uh, preserves our experience of the uniformity of nature, but seems to degrade God into a general factotum, constantly acting as the mechanic of the universe and bound to observe certain laws or certain covenants of action. It also, according to some thinkers, would implicate God in evil acts. So we could use fire to heat a pot of tea, but we could also use <coughs> fire to, to an arson in order to produce murder. And so is God implicated in the evil acts by, make, by giving fire its power, no matter how we use it. Um, at the other end, naturalism helps us make sense of the world. It explains law-like behavior, behaviors, but in its extreme form, it could be seen as anti-providential determinism. And by that I mean if God set the laws and powers in nature at the beginning, and they remain completely unchanged and untouched, then there doesn't seem to be any room for God's providential care or intervention in the world. And in some cases, it would seem to tread on God's omnipotence. For having created an established order, he cannot step in to alter or suspend it. And so for some, it, tends, it could tend to render God unnecessary. God creates the world, puts everything in motion, and then becomes an absentee God, just goes away and does his own thing, whatever that might be. Um, and so it runs ultimately to deism. So how did, let's, let's look at some historical examples. Um, in Christianity, occasionalism was always a minority position. Uh, naive supernaturalism was rejected already in the patristic period. And the clear counter argument to naive supernaturalism is that yes, God can do anything, but he doesn't. He doesn't, for example, turn tomatoes into rhinoceroses suddenly. In fact, of all the possible things that could happen in the world, we see only a very, very small percentage of them. If you think about all possibilities, what we actually see is a very narrow selection of those events that would be possible for an omnipotent God. Um, so uh, to deal with this issue of the, 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 the subset of things that we see versus the enormous, the infinite number of things we could see, 
Um, that was answered in a definitive way by 13th century theologians, such as, uh, such as Alexander of Hales, uh, Albert the Great, and St. Thomas Aquinas. So building on ideas of earlier theologians, they distinguished two kinds of divine power. The first, simply God's omnipotence, which in Latin is called his the potentia dei absoluta, the absolute power of God. The other is the subset of these that God actually chooses to exercise given the creation that he freely chose to make in a particular way. And this they called the potentia dei ordinata, God's ordained power. So while he could turn tomatoes into rhinoceroses at any moment, he chooses not to do so. And that power is not part of his potentia ordinata, even though it's part of the potentia absoluta. Um, in brief, said St. Thomas, it is ridiculous to say that God does something just because he can. And here Thomas, in that part of his writings, is talking about, in, in, in a sense, people who are calling in God as the cause of things. He says, is there anything more stupid than to say God does something just because he can? Um, but St. Thomas also addressed the issue at the other end of the spectrum, namely that the position of a strong naturalism runs the risk of making God unnecessary after the initial act of creation. And in this, regard, in this regard, he proposed what he calls a concurrence, namely that divine will concurs continually with the action of created natural causes. And I'll quote here from his Summa, quote, God causes the action of everything in as much as he gives to everything its power to act and conserves it in being and applies it to its action. What he means, I think Thomas often needs it, unpacking. What he means is that things have existence and hence power to act only through participation in the being and power of God. God as the source of being itself maintains things in existence by his own existence and will. And as Thomas continues, quote, it is through his power that every other power acts. He is present in all things, not as an essential part of them, but as maintaining them in being. So in other words, if God should, should choose to withdraw his concurrence, being except for himself would cease to be being. Um, let me continue with what Thomas says. Thus, we should conclude that he acts in every agent immediately, but without eliminating the action of the will and of natures. So holding things in existence by participation, yet there are natural causes. So this is a, a modified view of naturalism. It's still naturalistic, that natural powers exist in nature, but God is maintaining the whole system in existence. All right. Well, mainstream Christian theology has historically held a position decidedly on the naturalism side, and I think this is something crucial. One of the questions, historians of science have ceased asking this question, I'm not sure that we should have done, but the question is, why is modern science essentially a product of European culture? We have lots of examples of technological developments in Asia, for example. We have early Islamic science, which is of remarkable quality and importance and influence. But is there something particular about Christianity, about European culture, about European civilization that leads to the sciences? This is a very unpopular thing to question or to ask nowadays, but I think perhaps you should still question it. Um, I do think that this idea of naturalism, which is embedded in Christianity, um, is part of the answer. And why is naturalism embedded in Christianity? That's a huge question. That would be another whole seminar series. But uh, just to give you something to think about, I have difficulty imagining it doesn't have something to do with the idea of the incarnation, that in fact, the created world was so good and so important that God himself entered into it. That gives a certain dignity to creation that it simply does not have, for example, in Islam. 
And I think that I think there's something important there. That's just an aside. All right. Um, anyway, uh, Christianity has been decidedly on the naturalism side, but not radically so. Um, medieval thinkers, as I mentioned to you yesterday, preferred to appeal to nature for explanations of natural things rather than resort resorting to the first cause, that is God. Um, created things have power of their own to cause effects, which are guaranteed by God's benevolence, but God can intervene directly in the world, even though this is rare. Recourse to God's direct action, um, saying, well, God did it, uh, he can do anything, was not a satisfactory answer, and as I mentioned yesterday, it will tend to lead to the God of the gaps problem in most, if not all, cases. Now, let me just stop for a second here and say that my students certainly are always surprised when I say this sort of thing to them because they've grown up with a, a parody view of the Middle Ages where it was all magical and superstition and blah, 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 blah. No, the medievals were very, or medieval theologians, we're not talking about average medieval peasant in the street, but they were very clear about not resorting to supernatural explanations unless absolutely necessary. Um, we can see an example of this in commentaries on creation. These are called the hexameral treatises, the treatises on the six days of creation. Now that might strike you as an odd place to look, since we might expect the direct action of God at creation most of all. Well, yes and no. It's a point of dogma that God created what is out of nothing. That, of course, had to be his direct act, because prior to creation, there was nothing but God, and therefore, no possible secondary causes. But for medieval theologians, they seem to have favored only an initial primary causation by God. So let's look at some examples. St. Augustine, in his uh, literal commentary on Genesis, argues for an instantaneous creation. Not that the world is created as we see it today, uh, but he brought something into existence which contained within itself the seeds, the semina in Latin, of things that were to be. These seeds were directed and specified powers that God implanted in creation, and just as a seed contains within itself the power of producing a mature plant given the right conditions, so after God's initial instant of creation, the seeds began at different times and places that were appropriate to produce new forms according to their ordained powers. Others, such as the natural philosophers and theologians of the 11th and 12th century school of Chartres, dispensed with Augustine's semina while retaining a mere instant of creation. According to one of my favorites, uh, Thierry of Chartres, who was writing about 1135, 1140, God created in that primordial instance, instant only a confused primordial chaos composed of the four elements, fire, air, earth, and water, all mixed together. But he says that by the very act of their creation, the elements were endowed with particular properties, fire being hot, earth being heavy, and these native properties then took over as the causes that completed the cosmos. So, he says, differences in density caused the elements to separate, earth settling out to the lowest part, fire going to the highest part, and this, just like water going down and drain, caused the cosmos to begin rotating, and we see that rotation in the motions of the planets to this day. The motion in turn caused heat, and this heat acting upon the earth, which had agglomerated at the center of the universe, generated plants, animals, and finally human beings. Um, Terry's younger contemporary, William of Conch, who is a wonderful, wonderful writer, by the way, uh, writing about 1150, goes further. He says that since the same earth, water, and heat have continued to exist with the same powers, then there's no natural reason why new human races have not been produced naturally on the earth. But he says, we've never seen this happen. So perhaps there must be a divine prohibition against the origin of another human race. Now, that really inverts what we tend to think about 
in terms of creation, that here a 12th century Christian writer at a cathedral school invokes God not to create living beings, but to prevent it from happening naturally. Uh, uh, William of Conch writes his work in a dialogue format between himself and one of his two T's, the, the Duke of Normandy, later uh, England's uh, King Henry II. Um, and uh, of course, he's the master and his student says all kinds of silly things that have to be corrected. And one, at one point, the Duke of Normandy explains, stop it, you attribute everything to natural causes and nothing to the creator. And William just says, yes, yeah, so. <laughs> Basically, you know, and, and again, it's sort of in a, in a presaging of what Aquinas would say later. Why would you be so foolish as to call God in to explain everything that we can explain ourselves with natural causation? Um, well, an important uh, test case or place for naturalism is in miracles. And many medievals tried to explain even biblical miracles naturalistically. But one has to be careful how one says this because the topic's subtle and very important. Uh, let's take an example of something miraculous, like the parting of the Red Sea. Uh, Exodus states that there was, quote, a strong east wind that swept the sea throughout the night. And that gave medieval commentators the opportunity to argue that it was the wind that divided the sea, not the direct finger of God. So the general commitment to naturalistic explanations meant that God could be one step or more removed even from miracles. God did indeed part the sea, but not directly as its immediate cause. Instead, God, who had initially created air and wind with specific properties and, held and holds them in existence, worked through a secondary cause. And that's crucial not only to Christian theology, that God works almost invariably through secondary causes, but also to the way people relate to and study the natural world in what we call science. The consequence is that it elevates the status and dignity of created things by giving them both inherent powers and instrumentality in the hand of God. It makes them, in short, worth studying. And that's the point I'm trying to get to. If you have this kind of view of God, the way God acts in the world, it elevates the world itself because the world has so much uh, causal power. Um, right. Now, the problem is, of course, a sticky issue known as the discernment of miracles. How can we tell whether a particular action is, in fact, the result of primary causation? Uh, God intervening directly, a primary cause that's more direct than creation operating in the world, or just secondary causation acting in a perfectly natural way. That's an important issue for both theology and natural philosophy. Well, by the time of St. Thomas, the 13th century, and owing in part to his thought, miracles were defined as special events that are outside the common course of nature. They might be worked by God intervening directly, for example, in initial creation, or by his special application of secondary causes, perhaps with an enhancement of their natural powers, like making a wind strong enough to dry up the sea. Um, discerning a true miracle is tricky for two reasons, and our theologians were very sensitive to this point. First, a given phenomenon may have more than one possible cause. And you'll remember, I hope, this was exactly the point that Urban VIII made to Galileo, that you think the tides show the rotation of the Earth. They might, but there might be a different cause, maybe a cause we would never think to look for. Second, the result of a miracle might be just the same, that is, the effect might be just the same as that of a purely natural event, and thus difficult to recognize as anything out of the ordinary. So let's look at both of these problems. We have to determine if an if a, if a, if a, um, event falls outside the common course of nature. And the consequence for the science religion issue here is profound. It means that we have to know as much as possible about that common course of nature. So the need to identify miracles leads directly to the need for scientific knowledge. So let's take the specific example of the Red Sea. What are really the properties of wind and water? 
What are the meteorological conditions of the area? Uh, has this sort of thing ever happened before historically? What are the conditions that might allow it to happen? But of course, these things are never easy. And this really, I, I have to emphasize to you how a sticky point this, this was for a very, very long time, and well, it continues to be today. For our understanding of what constitutes the common course of nature is built up incrementally from experiences. We can't actually see the common course of nature. We just build it up incrementally, inductively from empirical information. Therefore, when we come up against a very rare phenomenon for the first time, it can initially appear to be miraculous. And then we need to turn again to the problems of causation. An event that displays a naturally inexplicable disproportion, let's say, between the power of the, of the evident cause and the effect is likely to be miraculous. And that requires us to know about and to quantify, to quantify the power of natural agents. But, what do we get, where do we get in the end? Well, St. Thomas takes us all the way to the end of his argument, as he often does. Um, since we cannot know causes with absolute certainty, remember, we can't actually see the causes operating. We see a cause, we assume a cause, and then we see an effect. We can't actually see them, uh, the link between them. Our final answer as to whether or not something is miraculous uh, can exist only in probabilities. And St. Thomas concludes that the absolute identification of something as a miracle or not as a miracle is ultimately an act of faith. He says this in his argument where he's talking about um, do miracles actually, uh, 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 are, are miracles actually proof of the faith? And he says, well, no, because you have to have the faith first before you decide that something is a miracle in the first place, in the second place. <laughs> so in fact, a miracle, you have to know it's a miracle first before you can have it increase your faith. You have to have the faith first before you know it's a miracle. The key point here is that scientific <clears throat> understanding by teaching us the limits of natural action is crucial, not only to understanding nature, but also to the discernment of miracles. So here's one clear overlap. One of the reasons I like to talk about this is it's an overlap between natural and theological inquiry and knowledge. The need to discern miracles encourages the nature of natural, encourages the study of natural laws and agency. Then in turn, the knowledge of natural laws and agency bears upon the discernment of miracles. So the case of miracles is one example of a co-development of science and theology. Well, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about miracles, but maybe I should stop for a second. This has been, this has been kind of tough sledding for, for us if you're not familiar with doing these kinds of mental gymnastics. So just going back to two things, Professor. Um, could you please discuss, discuss you use the word exameral in relation to... Hexameral. Exameral in relation to the, the creation. Could you uh, expound? Yes, yes. Um, in the Middle Ages, um, actually starting with St. Basil and, and St. Augustine, there are a series of treatises which became more, more clearly defined in the Middle Ages called hexameral, which is Greek for six days, the six days of creation. And so they're commentaries on the first chapter of Genesis. Now, you might think of these as being purely biblical commentaries. They were not. They were the places where medieval theologians and medieval natural philosophers, who were generally the same people, explored scientific issues. Because in the Middle Ages, the way you wrote a book was that you took an authoritative source and you wrote a commentary on it. This is the, the normal way of doing something. So in this case, the author would be taking the first chapter of Genesis as his authoritative text and then say very, very little about it but then use that as an example to talk about astronomy or geology or biology or botany because those things are mentioned in the text. And so the text gives a jumping off point. So the hexameral treatises of the Middle Ages are essentially scientific treatises, uh, but they are organized as a commentary on the first chapter of Genesis. Your, your comments have me thinking about like when the term miracle 
acquires the meaning it does, and because it's, I may be wrong, but it's not really biblical in nature. No, no, and, and, and certainly Augustine <laughs> talked about this in City of God, and it, and he doesn't come up with what we have. Okay. I mean, our, our views are really from the 13th century. They're from Alexander of Hales and, and Thomas Aquinas with further uh, uh, tweaks down the line. Supernaturalist than him coming out instead. Um, what category would he fit in from what you've explained so far? Yeah, I, I think he is. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example of one of the books that is generally not read so often. Um, he is definitely on the naturalism side, very, okay. very, very strongly. So he's got this wonderful, beautiful line in his commentary on Aristotle's physics. It's in the fifth book of his commentary on Aristotle's physics towards the end. He's commenting on Aristotle's favorite example of shipbuilders, right? Where he says, okay, well, the knowledge of shipbuilding is in the mind, Aristotle says the knowledge of shipbuilding is in the mind of the shipbuilder who takes the material and builds the ship. Thomas says, that the world is not like that. And he says, it is as if the shipbuilding art were within the wood. Do you see what he means by that? That in the natural world, things know how to assemble themselves. And so you get this sort of Harry Potter vision of the lumber of going together to make a ship, right? Uh, sort of flying out of the trees and making a ship. But this is what Thomas says, is it is, it is in, in the natural world, it is as if the shipbuilding art were in the wood. I think that's a, that, I mean, one could dissertate on that single line for, I think, a long time. So that is very supernaturalist, because mm -hmm. if it's within the wood, would that have been the direct command of God who made the trees of the Garden of Eden, and then the wood has a life of its own? No, it, it is natural because it's, it's in the wood. The, the knowledge of how things, it's in the wood. I mean, yeah, God put it there at some point in the distant past by creating the world so that natural things have natures. But God doesn't have to build the ship. The wood knows how to build the ship on its own. In other words, the shipbuilder is not, God would be the shipbuilder in this case. The shipbuilder is not taking the wood and putting it together. The wood is assembling itself. I don't want to get us down a, a rabbit hole, but maybe, maybe think of a question. But it's easy one, with this. Stuff. I just have to say, like, I'm just thinking I'm a knitter. I'm thinking about like the sheep wool and is that <laughs> anyway. Um, and also, there is like in the Harry Potter Universal Studios, if anyone's been, there's an actual like self knitting. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I, I'm sort of obsessed with like, and I know this is like the third rail, but this question when my students and I read these some of these texts, we are always talking about what we mean by European because, and I have a lot of reading to do on this, which is why I'm asking you, but a place like Cordova, where so much intellectual learning is going on and innovation is in Europe, but isn't it like, a, you know, Maimonides is from there, Ibn Rashid, and then something that I, you know, I say to my students and then I'm like, I joke with them, you know, I, I need to learn more about this. So I'm also asking this. I, I'm always interested in how much, it's weird to say, but even with the Crusades, how much cross pollination is going on amongst these cultures. Um, you know, one of my students said, so wait a minute, the Disney palace, like that idea of a European palace is from, I think, like Middle Eastern ideas of architecture could be wrong. This was like a, you know one of those questions where I'm like, I have to get back to you. But um, how much of St. Thomas's ideas, I mean, and I don't know if we can ever know, came from Averroes's uh, marginalia in translation? Like, I, I just don't, I've read that, but I don't know the details. Yep. And right. Um, these same kinds of issues about causation are so important that we find them certainly in Ibn Rushd of Aroes, we find them in Ibn Sina, we find them in Maimonides, and Thomas is completely familiar with those authors. He cites them frequently, sometimes with approbation, sometimes in, in critique, uh, but he's completely Can you not access the 
um, Aristotle through Ibn Rashid's translations. Is that not the case? Uh, it was. It, it was. It's not Ibn Rashid's translations. Uh, he he made commentaries on them. Okay. But the first Aristotle comes into the Latin West through Arabic translation. Now Thomas was also aware that these translations were often not very good because right. they've been translated from Greek into Arabic and then Arabic into Latin, right. possibly with Syriac in the middle somewhere. Um, and so he actually, Thomas actually requested one of his Dominican brethren, uh, Willem von Morbeke, who was a Flemish Dominican, who had been um, appointed the Bishop of Corinth in Greece. When you're in Corinth, see if you can find mm -hmm. Aristotle in Greek wow. and do a translation. Right. And so it's through Willem of Morbeke um, that Aristotle comes into Paris directly from Greek. And he's already read, Thomas already read the other translations, and so he's... Oh, yeah, yeah. He, had read the, he had read the first translations, and there are sentences in it that make no sense whatsoever. Right, right. Because the translations are just not that good. And then he read Ibn Rashid's um, commentary as yeah, well. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yes. Oh, a lot of questions, okay. <clears throat> I'll take these three and then we'll carry it, please. So back to the soul assembling ship, which to yes. me sounds kind of bizarre, but I think I it, it. one <laughs> vestige of that. An old friend of one of my husband's brothers, I guess, was a cabinet maker. And according to my husband, he would always say that when he selects a piece of wood to carve, that what he wants is already in the wood, <laughs> and he just releases it. And it wasn't kind of a religious but it was the same idea that something was in the wood already. And, I just, and here, the, in this case, the cabinet maker's art is in the wood. The wood would make itself into a cabinet on its own. Well, no. I oh, no, I mean, according, according to Thomas. That's what Thomas Right. Someone would say it was there to be shaped and released, but it already right. existed, which was interesting. So my question involves, there are lots of visually stunning things in our natural world. For attributing them to, say, Miraculous versus, say, witchcraft. How do you balance that at this time? Because, so I, I'm I going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk about witchcraft and demons in just a second. Okay. Because <laughs> I can see, like, I've had chemical reactions, there's a clock reaction. Yeah, yeah. Which can go from clear to jet black and then back. You can be oscillating and it's visually stunning. I, if someone was doing it, I'd be like, oh, that's witchcraft. <clears throat> At the same time, I visualized I was in Norway and I saw sundogs, mm -hmm. which is refracting of light, and it appears like there's glowing suns all around you. And for the and in Norse mythology, they see this all the time. So they're like, "Oh, this is just the natural occurrence of our world." But if I saw when I saw it for the first time, I was like, "Oh, like, what is going on?" Right? Like this was miraculous in that sense. This is the old light around me. So I was curious about that context. Okay. Yeah. Me like, yeah. Yeah. No. No. That's 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 a terrific question. And again, it's about um, trying to figure out what is natural, what is not, and it can be it can be difficult. And also, you talk about like the sun dogs or the clock reaction. Um, this is one reason why in the scientific revolution, people are so fascinated by what they call prodigies or monsters, things that happen very very rarely. Are these the common course of nature? Are these divine signs? What are they? Um, one of our virtual viewers had a question. Um, he's asking, is what you said is just an aside, is it really just an aside, or is it the crux of the matter, aka the main point that some get and some others don't? Uh, which aside was the, oh, about Christianity and science? I think so. Um, it, yes. Yeah. Um, I call it an aside simply because I don't know that I would be willing at this point without doing a lot more research to maintain and defend that position before a jury of my peers. Um, I just threw it out as something for people to think about, and I think I need to think about it more as well. So. I'm sure you can. <laughs> I'll think about it. Okay, so. Um, now, uh, miracles became a particular problem theologically and scientifically in the 17th century. So now we're getting back to the scientific revolution. At that time, after the Reformation, some reformers, particularly Calvin and his followers, and through them Anglicans, 
invented the doctrine of the cessation of miracles, namely that the age of miracles was over. It ended with the apostle of the death of the last of the apostles, so John. Um, now there's a practical motive here. It was intended, certainly in Calvin's case, it was intended to, to discredit Catholicism, which held that miracles continue to occur and continue to testify to the Catholic faith. So by claiming an end to miracles, um, Protestants um, reckoned that they could simultaneously knock the evidential props out from under Catholicism and declare Catholic miracles as fraudulent. But there was an unintended consequence. Short of the evidential, that is the testimonial power of miracles, some Protestant thinkers of the 17th century turned to the investigation of witch and demon activity in order to gather evidence of the spirit realm in their struggles against perceived atheism. Several well-known English natural philosophers, including Robert Boyle, talk about more about him later, participated in this endeavor. And it, it, it's, it's sort of a, a risky endeavor that, you know, you're getting rid of miracles because they might support Catholicism, so you need some evidence of the spirit realm, and instead you're going to look for witchcraft testimonies. Um, as you can imagine, it didn't turn out really well. Um, <laughs> but uh, this was a serious endeavor, um, which was carried out in part by members of the Royal Society of London and so forth. So having mentioned that, it's worth talking a little bit more about demons, because demonic activity was of great interest to both theologians and natural philosophers, it provides a counterpoint to God's activity. Um, the theological position states that demons cannot perform true miracles, but only trick us into thinking that they can. This is because demons do not have supernatural power. They were not given to it by God, who reserved such power to himself. Demons do have two advantages over human beings. They know natural laws perfectly. They've had longer to study them than we have. And being incorporeal, they can move with infinite speed. I'm taking this out of medieval theological debates about it. So think about it. An incorporeal being has no dimensions. Therefore, it is not restricted to three-dimensional space, which is the domain of corporeal substances, and so it can move between point A and point B without ever being in between. Um, thus demons can appear to work miracles, but all they can really do is go get natural agents very, very quickly. They know what they are and where they are, and then apply those agents to particular subjects in an instant. And so once again, we're back to the critical issue of discernment. What looks like a miracle might not be, and in fact, erroneously believing one might involve you with demonic actions. And since demonic action must be entirely natural, a very learned human being could do nearly as well as a demon, except for the part of moving with infinite speed. Hence, knowledge of the natural world, what we call science, gives even human beings the power to produce seeming, seeming, miracles. In short, this is technology, which can produce marvels, but not true miracles. And the arguments, it's very interesting about the arguments about demonic power and the power of the human being. Um, um, the idea was that if you had enough knowledge about natural agency and how to use natural agency, you could then be able to produce technological marvels that look almost miraculous. And this too is a, in, an instigation to discovering more about the natural world and discovering the limits of natural powers and actually what they are. So in my last couple of minutes, let me apply what we've learned in a new direction. Some more recent forms of Christianity, since we've been talking about the Middle Ages, um, exemplify the link between God, views of God's activity in the world and trust in scientific inquiry. I'm referring now to some non-mainstream sects like American fundamentalism that greatly enhance the frequency and importance of what they call miracles. Um, 
when I was in what I call my exile in the Midwest, when I was doing my PhD in Indiana, um, I used to watch late night television and you could turn on the television very reliably to see a miracle anytime you wanted. They uh -huh. broadcast, right, right? They broadcast miracles all the time. Their members were taught to expect miracles the way the rest of us expect the afternoon post. Um, in some, they adopt a position of naive supernaturalism where God is constantly intervening in a way that is also erratic. And such a position, as we've seen, diminishes the role of natural causation and thus the scope of scientific frameworks. In what I think we can now recognize as a related development, the same groups attribute far greater power to Satan and demonic forces than is acceptable in Orthodox, lowercase o, Christianity, to the point that their worldview borders on or even falls into Manichaean dualism. So if you turn on the local television in some parts of the country, you're likely to hear frequent references to the power of Satan and the battle between good and evil forces, much as the Manichees would have expounded to a very skeptical St. Augustine. As a result of one, weak discernment criteria for miracles, and two, a dualist mentality, their spiritual and corporeal worlds are fundamentally disordered. The spiritual world is disordered by a supposed struggle between God and the forces against him. Of course, to answer that, all you have to do is think as St. Augustine did. What would it mean to oppose omnipotence? Indeed, the situation is little different from what I mentioned at the very start today regarding polytheism and a squabbling pantheon. The natural world, for them, is similarly disordered because it is so full of immediate divine interventions that there is little sense in seeking out, or even less, in trusting a common course of nature, the regularities which constitute science. Now, given this situation, I think it is not surprising that it is the same sex. These are the ones that most consistently oppose or devalue scientific inquiry, explanation, and education. And as I said before at the beginning, I think we've gotten to a point where you can see that one's view of God's activity in the natural world orients one's view towards the natural sciences. Thank you. Let me begin with the first of this. Um, all right, there we are. Uh, what is natural theology? Well, it's defined as the drawing of inferences and proofs regarding God from the natural world. And the general concept of doing so dates back to Christianity. Um, but usually when we speak of natural theology, we are referring to a very specific practice that arose only at the end of the 17th century. Um, as for its lifespan, um, natural theology showed a lot of resiliency. It was popular through to the 19th century and continues to exist in modified forms to this day, largely through manifestations of um, its main its main um, attribute, the argument from design. Uh, its origin and use is centered in the Anglophone world. This is not to say that it was absent on the continent, but that the vast majority of works on natural theology were written in Britain and later in America. Accordingly, the natural theology that's usually so-called tends to appear almost exclusively in Protestant contexts, um, I'm not actually aware of, there are very, very few, I, I shouldn't say I'm not aware of any, but there are very few Catholic works that fit into the natural theology category as it's customarily defined, as for example, John Brooke in your reading defines it. So let's look at its origins and evolution. Um, a foundational text in the genre is the work of John Ray. Ray was born in 1627. He studied at Cambridge, became interested in plants, proposed some early classification systems for them. Uh, some of them is still in use, modified later by Linnaeus. Um, in 1667, he was made a fellow of the Royal Society of London, and he published prodigiously. He was also an Anglican priest. He was ordained in 1660. So he's another one of these people that indicates how churchmen and natural philosophers, scientists were one and the same. In 1691, <clears throat> um, he, excuse me, <clears throat> he published The Wisdom of God Manifested in the Works of Creation. 
It was a very popular book, reprinted frequently for the next half century. It was based upon the conviction that, quote, there is for a free man no occupation more worthy and delightful than to contemplate the beauteous works of nature and honor the infinite wisdom and goodness of God. Um, the study of the natural world for him is therefore a kind of worship, as I mentioned in an earlier lecture. So the next important step in the development of natural theology um, were the Boyle lectures. I spoke about Boyle before. Well, Boyle, when he died in 1691, left money in his will to support an annual lecture in the defense of Christianity. Uh, now, Boyle, who was very ironic in his views about different Christian denominations, stipulated that the Boyle lecturers could not, as he, as he put it, descend to the controversies betwixt Christians. Instead, they were only supposed to um, promote Christianity against non-Christians and atheists. Now, the first lecturer in 1692 and 93 was Richard Bentley. Um, he took aim against atheism and did so using the most recent scientific discoveries of the day. In fact, he, he uh, wrote letters to Isaac Newton to get information about the sort of cutting edge science that could be used against atheism. Um, his lectures set the tone that the Boyle lectures would carry largely to this day, because although there was a hiatus in the Boyle lectures, they have been um, uh, revived in the early 21st century, and so they now still go on every year. The following year's lecture spoke on the identity of Christ as the Messiah, which was perhaps much more in line with Boyle's intent, but his work proved not only anomalous, but was quickly forgotten. The best known Boyle lectures were always those that dealt with natural theology, in particular, natural theology against atheism. Um, particularly, uh, here's Boyle, um, here is Bentley's uh, sermon, uh, a set of six of them. Uh, here's, you can see uh, across the top, a confutation of atheism from the origin and frame of the world. So he's looking at particularly astronomical uh, uh, features and how this confutes atheism, that it must speak for a designer, um, Isaac Newton. Uh, another popular one, these are Samuel Clark's Boyle Lectures, a discourse concerning the being and attributes of God, the obligations of natural religion, and the truth and certainty of Christian revelation. Um, a particularly popular series were those given by William Durham, uh, which he called Physico Theology. Uh, these were revised and reprinted and read down to the 1760s and, and even after. So Physico Theology, that is a theology that is derived from the physical world. So not from scripture, but from the physical world. Well, this popularity of the Boyle lectures uh, provokes the question that I answered for you before, who are all these atheists they were arguing against? Again, no one could point to a particular atheist. What they seemed to fear most was not a philosophically based atheism, but rather a vague, unthinking, what we might call a functional atheism, uh, of uh, rakes and wits and persons of loose morality. And that seems to be the panic that the Boyle lectures and natural theology was intended to address. Um, all right. Well, in 1802, there appeared the most famous example of the genre. This is William Paley's Natural Theology. There it is or evidences of the existence and attributes of the deity collected from the appearances of nature. Paley was an Anglican vicar. He was a writer of textbooks. There's nothing really original in this. Essentially, he took everything that had been written from the 18th century, and as a textbook writer does, puts it in an easily digestible form. The book was regularly read in university curricula and greatly impressed uh, a large number of famous people, including a young Charles Darwin. Um, so the hundreds of works on natural theology that appeared over the course of nearly two centuries were written by a variety of authors, natural philosophers and clergymen. Um, they gathered their examples out of the scientific writings of others. 
there was also an important Dutch writer by the name of Ber Bernard Nieuwentijd, who was a mathematician and a doctor of medicine. He wrote one of the few notable non-British works on natural theology, but then it went through more printings in England than it did in the Netherlands in English translation. So the main thrust of all this, oh, what was it? Some argued that the attributes of God could be drawn from the natural world, for example, his goodness. But most natural theology was merely to prove God's existence. This goal was already clear in John Ray's book. And let me quote a very long 17th century English sentence out of his, out of his 1691 book. He writes, <clears throat> There is no greater, at least no more palpable and convincing argument of the existence of a deity than the admirable art and wisdom that discovers itself in the make and constitution, the order and disposition, the ends and uses of all the parts and members of this stately fabric of heaven and earth. For if, in the works of art, as for example, a curious edifice or machine, counsel, design, and direction to an end appear in the whole frame and in all the several pieces of it, they do necessarily infer the being and operation of some intelligent architect or engineer. Um, apparently, uh, punctuation periods, at least, were in very short supply in 1770. <laughs> So this is a fine example of how most natural theology rests upon one principle, the argument from design. The argument from design holds that the smooth functioning and intricate contrivance of natural objects implies a designer, that is, proof for the existence of God. Well, the classic example, one that you may well have heard of, is the story of the watch, and it's told famously by uh, William Paley in 1802, although he collected it out of Neuventite. Um, the story goes like this. Imagine you're wandering around in some isolated spot out in on a moor and you find a watch lying on the ground. You pick it up, you look at it, you see how beautifully the gears are cut, how perfectly they fit together. You notice that the right materials have been chosen to make it and you wonder, where did it come from? So from the watch, you infer that there must have been a watchmaker and even if there's no one in sight, you can find no direct sign or record of the watchmaker. You know the watchmaker must be out there somewhere, um, simply because you have the watch in your hand. And the argument then moves from the artificial to the natural. Consider the eye. See how beautifully it is put together, how ingenious is the adaptation of its parts. And therefore, looking at the eye, you are sure of the existence of a designer of the eye, which we conclude to be God. Okay, that's how the argument for design works. What did people in the 18th century make of this argument? Well, the argument for design was subject to criticism by the middle of the 18th century, and not just, and not even predominantly by those inclined to atheism, because the argument turns out to be weak, ambiguous, and actually from the perspective of Christianity, potentially dangerous. Um, several thinkers, David Hume among them, pointed out that arguments from design might not take you where you want to go. A watch might imply a master watchmaker, but it could also imply a workshop of watchmakers. And so it gets you to polytheism. It could point to a sort of apprentice watchmaker who's not that good because the watch breaks down. It doesn't take you to a, a god who, in <clears throat> Thomas's words, is the foundation of being. Even if we get to monotheism, the God of natural theology is far from the Christian God. He's without moral force or unique eternity, personal concern, or any kind of providential care. And in fact, it is deists who believed in a God who is impersonal and detached, latched on to natural theology as much as Anglican vicars. Deists used it to show that, the Christi that Christian revelation was unnecessary. The principles of religion could be gathered entirely from nature by reason, so that that meant that faith, revelation, and church were unnecessary. So when pressed too forcefully, the argument from design can actually encourage non-Christian views of God, because it emphasizes, it overemphasizes arguments drawn from reason for his mere existence, 
at the expense of faith in the revelations of his attributes. So I like to say that from a, actually a Christian perspective, merely demonstrating the existence of a God is a pretty cheap commodity. I, I mean, I, it, it, it's not theologically very sophisticated. Um, there's a danger, there's a designer God, so sort of big deal. He could be the God of the Neoplatonists who doesn't even know he's created the universe and doesn't care about it or you or me. Um, it's antithetical to the Christian message of God as father. Well, besides the end point of the argument, there are problems with its mechanism. The argument is held together by analogy. And analogical reasoning is only as valid as the analogical basis is sound. And what do I mean by that? So let's consider the propositions. A watch implies an intelligent watchmaker. Okay, that's no problem because we know where watches come from, we know how they are made. Then this proposition is used analogically to say that the eye implies an intelligent eye maker. But this assumes that natural things like eyes are produced like artificial things, watches. And this is really the legacy of the 17th century mechanical philosophy that I mentioned to you yesterday that saw the whole world as a functioning machine. It's a mechanical analogy. Is the world really like a machine? Are our bodies really like machines with levers and gears and cogs and uh, hydraulic pressure and so forth? Natural things arise spontaneously as units from seeds, eggs, and such like. And they also reproduce themselves, as Aristotle will tell you. Artificial things are composites that are assembled piece by piece by piece. Now, back at home, I have a drawer full of watches. And I have never opened, I haven't actually opened the drawer in a while, so maybe I should do this when I get home. I have never opened the drawer to find a lot of little watches, <laughs> the brown ones I put in there. The second assumption is that God, the maker of natural things, works like a human being, the maker of artificial things. Besides being inherently unlikely, this is dangerous as an anthropomorphism. It threatens to make God's activity rather banal. It turns him into a watchmaker. Uh, it makes God's work mechanical and robs him of transcendence. It tends to take God out of that transcendence above nature and put him into nature that he's working like things, like just another cause within the natural world. And that to me is an extremely dangerous place to get to. Um, <clears throat> worse yet is the fact that design can be in the eye of the beholder. We can't tell whether what we perceive as design is real or our construct. We can't put a designed universe next to an undesigned one and compare them. There's no valid control, no yardstick by which we measure degrees of design. Well, another way of saying this um, is that before you can have an argument from design, you have to have an argument for design. Um, so arguments for design often rely on appeals to ignorance. We cannot imagine how an intricate system could come to be without an intelligent designer. And all such arguments, I think, lead inevitably to a God of the gaps problem. We don't currently have a way to explain what we see, so we resort to God, a de literally a deus ex machina, as explanation. Um, and finally, arguments, whether they're from design or for design are not really rational arguments if you break them down. They appeal actually to our emotions, to our feelings of awe and wonder, which are completely legitimate in the face of the natural world. But they appeal to awe and wonder rather than to the kind of reason that would have been appreciated by someone like Thomas Aquinas. Um, the world is an extraordinary place full of marvels, but you really can't turn admiration and awe into an argument. Not into, you can't make a syllogism out of it. So I think design arguments are terrific for exhortation in a devotional context. They're, uh, they're unsatisfactory in a probatory one. And my sense is that the very early uh, 
crafters of the natural theology used them as devotional, not as probatory. It's that over time they, they came to take on this probatory need, the, this probatory purpose that they're not well suited for at all. Um, this is a shift in what natural theology was asked to do. It was originally about heightening devotion in believers, and so it was intensely personal. The scientist goes out and sees things, enhances his or her devotion. But this function was displaced progressively in favor of use as an apologetic to convince non-believers. And I think that's very weak. Um, so we should overlook here the hand of history. Natural theology's development, as I said, stems largely from circumstances peculiar to 18th century England. So first, the reliance on this, arg on this argument was largely a response to paranoia about perceived atheism. But there was also pressure to turn to reason to prove religious ideas because of the political situation in England in the late 17th century. The English Civil War of the mid 17th century left a legacy of religious dissension and sectarianism, especially by low church enthusiasts, Puritans and such like. People who relied on personal experiences of faith and revelation who opposed the Church of England. One solution was to turn to reason-based argument rather than to faith or Bible-based argument with the assumption that reason is common to all people. I'm not so sure that's true. But, um, and thus something that even sectarians could agree on. Members of the Royal Society of London, the first English scientific society, believed that experimental natural philosophy was something that people of differing religious affiliations could agree upon. Thus, with the social and political need to restore order and unity in Britain at the restoration of 1660, after the Civil War, the alliance of natural philosophy and religious apologetic was a natural solution. So now I think you can see why natural theology, I think, flourished, especially in Britain, not on the continent, and never in Catholic countries. And thirdly, I tried to say this yesterday in answering a question, there's something very English about the image of a proper, well-ordered world governed by a beneficent sovereign. Indeed, the similarity between the natural theologian's view of the world and the projected image of the English state and crown after the restoration has been remarked upon by several historians. <laughs> um, uh, there's also a social, and ge I mentioned this yesterday, there's a social and geographical specificity to natural theology. If you're a country vicar sipping your sherry, looking out the window at the cows grazing on the pasture, you tend to think about a good and beneficent God better than if you're starving to death um, trying to get food to feed your family in the desert. Um, so I would argue that the popularity of natural theology in the Anglophone world was in the end self-defeating for its proponents. Um, by the start of the 19th century, with Paley's book in particular, natural theology had become an entrenched part of the culture and the first and virtually only line of defense for theism. Not that theism actually needed a defense at the time. Again, it's hard to point at any of these atheists everybody was afraid of. Um, this reliance upon natural theology and the design argument set the stage for a much more contentious reception later in the century of Darwinian evolution than was necessary. Because what does Darwinian evolution do? It cuts the props out from underneath the design argument. So if you've been relying on that as your only uh, bulwark for uh, theism, well, you're in a bad shape at that point. Um, so Darwinian evolution and natural selection acquired a taste of atheism that it need not have done. And I would say that the reception of Darwinism was conditioned and directed by the preceding entrenchment of natural philosophy as an apologetic and a weak apologetic against atheism. And this may also help to explain the fact why was Darwinism much more assailed negatively in Anglophone countries than it ever was on the continent. 
continent didn't, wasn't relying on this argument from design, whereas Anglophone countries were, and so Darwinism became a problem in Anglophone countries. Okay, so now let me move on to the third and final section of my presentation. So you have had a sort of description, historical overview of natural theology as it's usually understood, but you know, as I've come to think about natural theology and what scientific investigation does for the religious believer, I've come to think that perhaps the definitions that are given are rather narrow of what natural theology, if we expand the definition, could actually contain. And it unconsciously recapitulates a fairly prevalent Anglo-centric focus in the history of science. So I want to break open, okay, soapbox moment for 20 seconds. One of the things that I've tried to fight against constantly, um, it's gonna take a minute, okay, is um, I'm really fed up with what I consider to be an Anglo-centric focus to my own discipline, to the history of science. So many of our works are written about England, about what happens in England. If you read a standard narrative of the scientific revolution, it starts with uh, Polish Copernicus and German Kepler and Italian Galileo. And as soon as Galileo gets condemned, the rest of the story is about England. It says the continent ceases to exist. And that is in part because we're English speakers, and that English speakers write the textbooks in English that we read, but we need to get beyond that and deal with what other languages have to say. The, the little book of mine that you have, um, <laughs> when one of my colleagues read it, uh, he said, oh, you know those stickers they put on products when they're, when they're better to tell you that it's new? You, you should have the, the publishing company put a sticker on your book that says, New and improved, now with 33% fewer Englishmen. <laughs> uh, um, and actually, my Italian, I have a lot of good Italian colleagues, and the Italians were just, they were amazed when they read my book. It's like, finally, there's a book that talks about the 16th century and about people who aren't English that actually contributed to the scientific revolution. Um, one of the other comments that was made to it, which was not necessarily made in a positive sense, was that there are too many Catholics in it. I said, well, yeah, I wasn't actually counting noses to figure out who was who. One of my, one of my uh, very dear friends in, in the Netherlands who is Jewish said, yeah, there aren't nearly enough Jews either. We need to have more Jews in there. And on basketball teams too. Um, that's exactly what he said to me. Um, okay, anyway, let me get beyond that. That probably took more than a minute. Um, if we go back before the time of Paley and Durham and Bentley, Ray, before the time in which natural theology became primarily a weapon against atheism, we can uncover practices that can be called natural theology, but of a very different sort. If we redefine natural theology more broadly as simply the use of the natural world to say something about God, his nature and activity, then we can uncover a much broader, more geographically and confessionally comprehensive source of nat sort of natural theology. Okay, um, to broaden the definition to include all readings of theological meanings in the natural world, I think would overstretch the term beyond, beyond any, any meaningful uh, borders. Um, because religious readings of nature are virtually ubiquitous. We could cite pagans like Cicero's De Natura Deorum, any number of passages from St. Basil, St. Augustine, the other patristics, or in fact, many of the characters I mentioned in the last lecture. But I want to propose that there exists another sort of natural theology in the early modern period, one that might prove quite instructive when compared to the better known sort of natural theology. Um, okay. Um, it seems to me that the natural theology of Paley and, and, and Bentley and the rest of them is in a sense already what we can call modern. This is a terribly loose word, but it comes from a time when there's already starting to be a separation between science and theology, where science is being used 
for the theological purposes as if they're different subjects. But there's a kind of, let's say, pre-modern or alternative uh, uh, natural theology that comes from the two still being completely intermeshed, science and religion, with one another. So let me give you some examples. Um, it's beautifully illustrated in a work by Robert Flood. You can see he's a bit earlier. He's an Englishman, um, where he draws this emblematic image of the universe. And it's not supposed to be literally read. It's metaphorically read, where you see up at the top the numinous cloud with the sacred tetragrammaton god with a chain to the female figure, which is nature, with a chain holding a monkey, which is the ape of nature that is art and artifice, what we would call technology. And here he's trying to show the interconnection between all the parts of the natural world, of plants and animals and minerals and human beings, the stars and so forth, and how they all go back first of all, to nature, to the female figure, but the, you see that she is in fact changed to the hand of God. Mm -hmm. And with that kind of a view of the interrelationships between the different parts of the natural world, between human beings, human artifice, the natural world, and God, we see a much more um, uh, cohesive picture of the universe not something where the science is being used for theological purposes, but rather where the two are really united in a sense. Um, a, another person who is, um, let's see. Um, right, Kepler, Johannes Kepler, we've mentioned him before, in the wonderful mustache. Um, he started talking, he, he was arguing in favor of Copernicanism at the end of the 16th century. Um, he, so uh, Flood was an Anglican, here we have uh, a Lutheran, who well, excommunicated eventually. In his argument for putting the sun at the center, um, and the planets in the middle, and then the sphere of the fixed stars on the outside, one of his arguments for this, and he considers it to be an argument, not to prove anything, but just to get you thinking about the way the world is the image of God, he says it has a triune nature, like God uh, uh, at the center, like the sun, and Christ, the, uh, the limits of the cosmos, and the intervening space, like the Holy Spirit, the love between the Father and the Son. And so he sees, looking out at the world, emblemata, you can use that word, an emblem of God instantiated in the world. And again, this is not for a pro, he's not trying to prove the Trinity based on this. He's not trying to prove heliocentrism, but he says, look, doesn't this make sense in a, in a way? If you see the world in eyes that see both science and religion in the same view. Um, my favorite example, however, is, oh, just really like Athanasius Kirsch. You remember, he's the one that descended into the crater of an erupting Mount Vesuvius. Um, uh, he published in 1641 a thick tome entitled On the Magnet or On of the Magnetic Art. And the motto for the book given on the frontispiece reads, everything is connected by hidden knots. Omnia nodis arcanis connexa. And the, what, he, what he does, he's a, an expanded version of it with this really beautiful um, frontispiece. What he has around the outside here, these are seals bearing the names of the various arts. So here's, let's see, here's music, geography, arithmetic, um, a, what is that? Um, astronomy, perspective, mechanics, uh, horography, and so forth. And you notice they're all connected by chains, showing the unity of knowledge, that there's a unity of knowledge, that all these arts are connected one with the other. They, in turn, are chained to three larger circles within. I'm going to blow it up for you. And here we have the sublunar world. So that's the world below the sphere of the moon. 
the sidereal world, that's the a world above the moon, so the rest of the cosmos. The little world, or the microcosm, that's human beings. And these three, notice, are also chained together, so knowing how they're connected. And then the three are touching here the mundus archetypus, the archetype world, and that's the mind of God. So what he's saying here, that um, the mind of God that holds the models or archetypes of everything possible in the universe is touching those three worlds, and then those three worlds are connected to all the arts and the sciences that we learn by studying them. Um, what this is, really, is that these are what he calls the invisible connections, or the hidden knots that connect everything in the world into a single cosmos. And what does cosmos mean? It means an ordered whole. Um, this, I said, was in the frontispiece to a book on the magnet. Now, how does this connect to the magnet? Well, it's a really thick book. Kierkegaard mm -hmm. hated writing short books. He only, <laughs> only wrote really big, thick ones. Um, well, how did, what does he talk about? Well, he begins where exactly you would think an exhaustive description of magnets and their effects. So if you ever done the, the, you probably did this in school, you may do it with some students where you put a magnet down, you put a piece of paper over it and sprinkle iron filings on it. Who was the first person actually to do that? It was actually a Jesuit by the name of Garzoni who did it for the first time in the uh, late, uh, 16, late 1500s. Why? Because he and the other Jesuits were really interested in what they called making the invisible visible. They wanted to see the invisible parts of nature. It was part of the discernment of miracles argument to see what are the things we don't see going on in the world. How can we understand them? How can we visualize them? And this business with using the iron filings to show magnetic lines of force was one of the ways that the Jesuits tried to make the invisible world visible, to make sense of it. So Kircher's book starts with that. It expands outward to other objects that display similar magnetic effects on other bodies. So like static attraction, when you rub a piece of glass or amber, it will attract bits of straw and paper. He goes further. How about the sunflower turning towards the sun? It shows there must be some invisible connection between the sunflower and the sun as well. How about sympathetic vibrations? If you have two stringed instruments tuned in harmony, you pluck a string on one, the other one starts vibrating by itself, which is what we know as sympathetic vibration. There must be a hidden connection between those strings through space that we cannot see. He then talks about the antipathy and sympathy between certain plants and animals. Some plants won't grow next to other plants. Anyone who's a gardener knows this, that you certain things you don't plant next to other ones. Um, then he talks about the motions of planets in their orbits. The planets keep moving uh, regularly in their orbits by some kind of power, by some kind of force. And slowly through the book, Kircher ascends from example to example in a way that to us, as moderns, we think is bizarre. How is he connecting all this stuff together? But it's part of his worldview that is extraordinarily comprehensive. He, he, he ascends again and again from magnets to plants to the planets, and finally his head emerges, as we would say it this way, beyond the Empyrean sphere, and he connects all of this to God's invisible and inescapable love. So that the one true original force that binds together everything that is. And so what he's saying is that we look at the world as a series of emblems of other things. This is not a kind of natural theology that tries to argue against the atheists. It's a kind of natural theology that teaches us to look out at the world as emblems of the invisible, of the invisible world. So for Kircher, if all these magnets are, should be emblems of God's love that draws us to him. And so we can witness and in a sense verify the divine love every day in the action of a magnet that clips a note to our refrigerators. <laughs>
That's a very different way of looking at the world. It's a very different way. For a man like Kircher or Flood or Kepler, the study of the natural world naturally included or rather entailed theology. Not that scientific material was applied to theological concerns, but rather the two were inseparable at every possible level. It seems to me that that's the truest definition of what could be called a natural theology, although it's quite different from the 18th century topic that customarily bears its name. So I don't know what you think of this. This is, uh, this is a, a, a pet idea of mine. So to look at this as a different kind of natural theology, totally different from what is usually called natural theology. Um, I think uh, if, if, if you read my little book, you'll see that that sort of fits in on every page, this idea of a very coherent view of the natural world. Something happened, and I'll leave you with this thought, and I'll open up for questions. Something happened at some point in the modern, as we came to modernity, whatever that means, that the pre-modern world liked to synthesize things, liked to put things together, to see things in a holistic vision. And at some point, we can almost point to the late 17th century, where dissection became what people wanted to do, to chop things into tinier and tinier bits, to see if they could find meaning in the separated bits of things, which is quite the opposite of the pre-modern, which tries to find meaning in the synthesis, in the putting together of things. And people, often, like students often ask me, what, is, what do we define modernity as? I think that's one of them, one of them. The other one is thinking that we're smarter than our ancestors. It's probably one of the other ones. Okay, anyway, that's enough for me. I've, I've, I've regaled you long enough for, for today. Thanks.